Hi, and welcome to our September webinar, German Research Using Case Studies. This webinar will show you some tips on resources to use to find your German hometown. Hopefully you'll get a hint or something that might help you crack that brick wall that you're struggling with. So welcome again to all the people that have joined us over the summer. And those of you know who I am, but for those of you that's new to this webinar series, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Kathy Worth, and I'm the owner of Family Tree Tours Heritage Travel. And I'm joined today by my partner, Matthias Utoff, over in Germany, who will speak to us in just a minute, but I think he's a little busy right now taking care of admitting and handling the chat box. But he'll be joining us a little bit later. And I'd like to explain a little bit before we get started about what Family Tree Tours does. As I said, we're a heritage travel company and we try to help people to go back to visit where their ancestors came from in Europe. We specialize in Germany and we can also do tours in Switzerland and Austria, German speaking countries, um, as Matthias is able to do that. And we also, I've done tours in, in Ireland and we have contacts in England and Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Italy, and I just recently have um, begun a partnership with somebody to do tours in France. So we got a lot of bases covered there, but as I said, we specialize in Germany, and what we normally do is take two to four uh, trips to Germany a year to specific areas of Germany, and then we stay in one place, so there's not a lot of packing and unpacking. And we try to help you to learn more about the traditions and culture, culture of that particular area. So that could be the northwest part of Germany or Baden or the Rhineland or Bavaria, Mecklenburg. Uh, we've done different areas, different years. And we try to help you to learn more about their life by having lectures by local historians. We meet with local researchers. We do a visit to an archive so you can get an overview of what might be held at an archive and how their system works. If you do want to do research there, we can help you to set up an appointment and maybe get you hooked up with a researcher that can help you if that's what you want to do. We also visit living history museums so that you can see how they lived. If we're in the north part of Germany, we visit either Bremerhaven or the Hamburg Immigration Museum. And the most important thing, of course, of what we do is to get you to your hometowns. We have free days throughout the tour where everybody gets to go out to their hometowns and you don't have to specifically be going to the same place. And so if your hometown is within a couple of hours from where our home base is, uh, we can get you to those hometowns. And what we do is get information from you, your sourced hometown. And we're, that's the information that I will send uh, to Matthias with the family names and that, and he does his magic and tries to find someone to meet you, show you around in the town, somebody that speaks English. We ask to make sure that the church is open, um, and we ask that the surname is still prevalent there, if the farm or the home is still possible to see. And uh, in, in some cases, they'll do more research. It just depends on who we can find there. So that's the most important thing of the trip, and it's been very successful for the past 13 years. Uh, we can't promise uh, cousins, but we do our best to, to make it uh, a trip of a lifetime for you. So if you'd like more information about what tours and, and we do and what we're planning for next year, fingers crossed, uh, you can look at our website, familytreetours.com, or shoot me an email. I'd be glad to answer any questions that you might have. So let's get started on what we're going to talk about today. But first, I got one uh, thing on, as I said, we've been doing these webinars throughout the summer. And I'm always uh, happy when I get a response from someone or get a message from someone that tells me that something that we told them helped them. And I'd like to give a shout out to a Carol who sent me an email and said, in one of your recent webinars, you mentioned that newspaper articles may be available regarding our ancestors' ship arrival in the U.S. after 1839. And this is for the Port of New York. So you can look at the New York uh, Times or the New York newspaper for that time period. And she said, I found information for three of my ancestors. I also learned about the prices of passage of the various classes and railroad schedules. Thank you so much for your tips on finding information that I never thought about. So thank you, Carol, for letting me know. It's always nice to hear something that uh, we talked about help someone. 
So hopefully you'll learn something today, and I'd love to hear from you if you do uh, learn something today. So let's get started. Today we're going to talk about German research using case studies. And we're going to show you some tips on resources to use to find your ancestral hometown. One of the big stumbling blocks for German research is to find that hometown. Because before you can start researching in Germany, you have to know a hometown. Unfortunately, uh, Germany was not Germany until 1871. And before that, it was a bunch of little kingdoms and principalities and dukedoms. And there was no national census in Germany. So we don't have the advantage that we have here in the States with the census where you can try to locate uh, someone. So what we have to do as German researchers is exhaust all US records in search of this German hometown. And in the handout, uh, I included a couple pages of research checklist. And these are ideas for you to have looked at before you give up on finding your hometown. So we're talking about looking at all kinds of records, vital records, birth, marriages, and deaths in, in the United States here. Use the census records to find when and where they lived. Go local to find out more information from the local area that they lived in. Now, you know, you want to get birth records and baptismal records and all the church records for all of the children that were born here, uh, probate records, uh, maybe church membership, naturalization records, their death records, military. So use those uh, checklists to see if you have used all of these sources to find your ancestral hometown. So we're going to do some case studies here. And the first one is uh, my great-grandfather, Johann Heinrich Peters, and he was born in 1836. And all I knew that he was from Germany. His wife was named Henrietta, and they lived in St. Louis. Uh, their daughter was Friederike, born in 1872. It was my dad's grandmother and my great-grandmother. And we knew that she had brothers Henry, Louis, and Christopher, our Christian, sometimes even mentioned as Christ. And so this uh, lecture here was given to a group that I lead called Germans in St. Louis. It was kind of an interactive uh, research group. So I was asking people what records and resources would you use to start searching. So in your own mind or maybe on your um, hand out there, you could write down what kinds of records you would have, from knowing this little bit of information, what you would have started searching with. But what I started with for my Johann Heinrich Peters was the census. And I started with the 1900 census, which uh, you can see how long I've been doing this. That was the last one that was released uh, when I started. And I found uh, Henrietta, who said she was widowed, uh, with a, two children, a Lewis and a Christopher. So that matched up some of the information that I knew already. And then I went back and I found them in 1880 as a Heinrich with his wife, Henrietta, and they had three children, Frederica, Lewis, and Christian and he worked at the Belcher Sugar Refinery, which something like that is added bonus because especially with a name like Peters, Heinrich Peters, that's going to be fairly common, and especially if you live in a bigger city uh, with a lot of German immigrants. So you want to have some kind of a, another kind of a modifier. So looking in the census, maybe you know that you've got the right person by the family names and also maybe by the occupation or where he worked. So then I found him in 1870 census, uh, Henry Peters with his wife and two children, uh, Lena and a Henry. I didn't know about Lena, but uh, found out later that that was a first baby that had died early. In an 1860 census, uh, I couldn't find him. And so that leads to some assumptions. And of course, my assumptions were that maybe he died between 1880 and 1900 and also that he may arrive between 1860 and 1870. So my next step was to check uh, city directories. Uh, I found Henrietta as a widow in 1896, so my assumption that Henry must have died between 1880 and 1896. And you can also use these city directories from the time period, the, when, when did I last know that Henry was alive, was an 1880 census. So start looking in city directories um, starting at 1880 and keep looking for him in the city directories to see when he 
uh, is not shown up in the city directories anymore. And we know that she was a widow by 1896. So sometime in that time period. And I also found, whoops, sorry, found a marriage date, uh, the 28th of October, 1865, in a St. Louis marriage index. It was done by St. Louis Genealogy Society. So I put that date in my pedigree chart and, and moved on. I also checked Germans to America, which is a set of books, and I found Johann Heinrich Peters to St. Louis in 1864. So there's my other assumption that he came between 1860 and 1870. And these books for Germans uh, to America is a set of red books. I think it's um, immigrants that came from 18, I think it starts in 1850 up into, um, I think close to 1900, I'm not sure exactly. I did put some links in the handout for some places that you can search this online now. Uh, it used to be the books, and they're, they're usually in uh, you know, genealogy library. Um, uh, you can do a search for that. But I did include a couple places where you can find them online. Now, I did find out a couple years ago that, you know, if you look at these books and you don't find your person in there, don't despair because, of course, everybody's not in there. And I uh, found out a couple years ago that these uh, indexes were made from ships that carried at least uh, 75 to 80 percent of German passengers. So maybe your person came over on a ship that uh, did not have that many Germans. Then I did find a ship's record for Henrietta Rua and a Louise Peter arriving in October of 1865. So there was a Henrietta and a Peters together and arriving in October of 1865. Now notice that she uh, married, um, or they were married in 28th of October of 1865. So come to find out that uh, this was Henrietta and uh, Louise Peters, and turns out that was Johann Heinrich's sister. So that told me that they did know each other in Germany, so they probably lived close to each other in Germany, and also that uh, they married within a week after she arrived. So they definitely must have known each other. So when I started uh, volunteering at a family history center, a fellow researcher there suggested that I look for the church record of their marriage. He asked me if I knew what church they were married at, and I said, I you know, have no idea. I would found that marriage date in an index. I put it in my pedigree chart. I was happy with that. Um, but he said, suggested, you know, you need to look at the church record. So I had the date, and then I found civil marriage license and um, that gave the pastor's name. And we're lucky in St. Louis that uh, early civil records for marriages were in, uh, so I think they started probably in the early 1820s, 30s, 40s, maybe in St. Louis. And so I had a pastor's name, but I didn't know what church he was from. And of course, like I told you, this was way back when, pre-internet, uh, pre-ancestry. I was just going to the libraries and looking in books and microfilms. And so um, I had to check what church this pastor was from. And I did that by looking in city directories. I looked for his name and hoped that it told what church that he might have been at, and which it did. Um, he was from, the church was Emmanuel Evangelical Lutheran Church. And so luckily those that uh, St. Louis churches were also microfilmed. And I did look at the church records for this uh, particular church and found um, Johann Heinrich Peters and Henrietta Rua getting married, and they both told where they came from. This is Ausbachhorst in Prussia and Osthorsta in Prussia. And I think, remember, on one of my previous webinars that we did, we talked about the dreaded Prussia. How do you find this? And these people were from, these two towns are in Westphalia, so pretty far uh, west in Germany. So this was in the 1860s. So you kind of have to know a little bit of history of of what all was Prussia during that time period. But this was, uh, you know, I had had that, that date and I had their marriage and for a couple of years, I hate to admit, um, before I found this. And so you do really have to uh, always look at the church book records too. So that is how I found the uh, first one of my ancestral hometowns. And so what basic resources did I use? I used census records, I used city directories, 
I used a marriage index, and you know now not to stop at a marriage index or any other kind of index, immigrant books, ships list, and the most important thing for this particular uh, problem was the church records. I found my answer in uh, the Lutheran church records. Okay, study number two, also using some basic resources. Uh, this belonged to one of my uh, group's uh, family, uh, and her ancestor was Carl Friedrich Wilhelm Wehmeyer. He was born on the 19th of March, 1837, and she got that date from the death certificate. Immigration records, he wasn't able to find anything on him. The census, he wasn't in the 1860, but 1870, 1880, 1900, 1910, all say born in Germany. He was married in St. Charles, and this is St. Charles, Missouri. I know there's other St. Charles's, but this was St. Charles, Missouri, on the 2nd of July in 1864. She found in a church indexes of marriages, but that index did not mention any hometown. And I wanted to remind you about um, these church indexes. Always remember that a lot of times these things are done very local, and they might be in a local public library or the local genealogy society or historical society. And so a lot of these times these things are not in, um, online. So just don't forget that you need to really go local and try to find um, things that may be indexed in books that are in a library somewhere. Naturalization record. She did find a typed card that said he was born in Prussia. There we've got our um, Prussia again. So that doesn't help you to narrow it down too much. And the Missouri death record. Uh, he died the 16th of December, 1911. And it gave his birth date and only said Germany again. We're lucky here in Missouri also that our uh, death records that start about 1910 up into, I think they're almost up to the 1970s by now, uh, death certificates online. So don't forget that uh, maybe your ancestor came over as a child, and so he might have uh, lived uh, past the date of when your state's death certificates start, or uh, maybe even the children of the uh, of the ancestor, they would have maybe said where their parents were born, give the parents' names on death certificates. So uh, just because your ancestor might have died previous to when death certificates started doesn't necessarily mean that there's, you can't find anything. Use all of the people that were related to your ancestor. She did find an obituary in uh, Dare St. Charles Democrat, which is a German newspaper, but again, no birthplace was listed for Carl. But again, we used church indexes, and she found a Weimeyer on an index at St. John UCC. He was listed as an early member and listed the family, <coughs> excuse me, as being from Vedum. And also checked the death index for this particular church, and it listed Carl as being from another town close to Vedum, but or close to spelling of Vedum, R-E-H-E-D-E-N in West Fallen. And there you see the uh, in the index there. So. Um, and as I said, a lot of times these churches like this, this is again going to be very local and they, you know, write their jubilees or their anniversary books. And a lot of times they will mention these first members that were, um, you know, maybe the new German immigrants and they wanted to start a German church. And so you always want to also kind of look to see whether there's a, a, a history or a jubilee anniversary book for the church that your people went to. So we have two town names and we don't know which is correct. So the, um, what I tell people normally to do is to look in myersgaz.org. I put that link in the handout too. So um, she found the town name, the correct one, using Myers Gazetteer, and it should be the W-E-H-E-D-E-N, Vaden, West Fallen. Um, no, I'm sorry, it should be Vaden, W-E-H-D-E-M in West Fallen. And so she needs, uh, at the time we did this uh, program a couple years ago, um, I think she's since verified that in church records, but at this time she needed to verify in the German um, church books for that. So once you find a town, that's your next step, but we're, we're still trying to, we're going to talk about how you find the town. So again, she looked in local church indexes. She used, looked at naturalization records. She, death certificate, 
uh, all, all the records that were associated with the, around the deaths to obituaries. And then when you do find a town name, you need to verify that you've got the right town spelling. And a lot of times if you just take that name that they give you and you try to find it on a map or try to find it, you're not going to. So uh, I suggest using myers Gaz to find the correct town name or spelling of the town name. And so case study number three, using some advanced resources. So this same lady had another ancestor named Johannes Grau, who was born in 1835 and died in 1898. She looked for immigration, didn't find anything. Uh, census, um, 1860 through 1870 through 1880, they all mentioned Württemberg. And that's another reason why I like to stress to always uh, look for your people in the census. First of all, it's going to give you a place where they lived and a time period of when they lived there so that you can go local and find out more records. But also these years, 1860, 1870, uh, for German um, immigrants, a lot of times because Germany wasn't unified Germany until 1871, they might mention and the area that they came from. So at least she's narrowed down her search a little bit to Württemberg. And she also looked at the local genealogy society and they again had the index church records and she found two marriage records and the baptisms of his children and death records. But again, no mention of the hometown there. She did find a naturalization record. And again, that mentions Württemberg. Uh, he filed his first papers in 1865. So again, because Germany wasn't Germany yet, um, he did mention that uh, Württemberg. And obituary, again, did not mention the hometown. So we're, you know, again, striking out on lots of different things. So she accidentally, and I'll explain this a little bit more, she accidentally uh, checked a uh, Catholic Church marriage index and found um, a great grand aunt, Anna Maria Juliana Grau, who was converting to get married. Uh, she had been uh, a Lutheran. So I had asked Jan about, you know, the, the story behind this. Why did you accidentally check a Catholic Church marriage book? And so she was at a library in the genealogy section, um, and she was looking, just looking to see if there was anything else that she could check, these index books. And she saw uh, this book for St. Francis of Assisi Catholic Church in a, a town that she recognized that um, the name that had been maybe popped up in her family history. She remembered that her great grandfather's sister who had immigrated with him had married a Frenchman and that they lived up in that area. So that's why she kind of thought, well, I'll just look, look in that book since it's in the area. And that's when she found that, uh, that her um, great aunt or had married a uh, married a Catholic, and so she converted from um, being a Lutheran. So the conversion record was on a film from St. Louis Catholic Diocese, and this gave her parents' names, uh, Johannes Grau and Katerina Lang. I want to explain about the I-N on the end of that name. A lot of areas of Germany, in some places, they have different um, endings for this, but the I-N or E-N, and in some place, other places it could be something else. It's uh, denoting a female. So I know when I first started looking in church books, I kind of, um, I would have probably passed over that because I thought, well, that's not the exact name that my people are. Uh, but then if you kind of study the church book records and you'll see um, most of the females might have that ending on there, then you know that they're using um, an, uh, a female um, ending. And so this is, uh, and then you're going to look for her as Katerina Lang, not Langen. And so now she knew uh, the parents' names, but still no place of birth for these, uh, this Grau family. And so at one of our meetings of Germans in St. Louis, um, I was telling them about the Baden-Württemberg Immigrant Database. And um, because she knew that they were from Württemberg through those different resources that she had used, the naturalization and the census records, uh, we did a search for Grau's and uh, family and, and bingo, they, they were found. And we think that it even mentioned a um, farm name. So I'm going to show you, I put the link in there also for this Baden-Württemberg immigrant database. And this I'm, I'm calling like an advanced resource because you, if you know an area, 
you can try searching these immigrant databases. There's lots of them out there. But if, if you don't know an, even an area of Germany, you could spend years just looking through all of these. So uh, we looked at it, and this is what this particular database looks like. It's uh, from the Landesarchiv in Baden-Württemberg. I know you can't read that little writing. I'm going to show you a blow up there, but I just wanted to show you what the whole page looks like. Um, they do have an English button on the right-hand side, uh, but I suggest that when you use this kind of a database, you know, if you can, once you know what you're doing with it, kind of leave it in German because sometimes if you um, are looking for a name, it might literally translate it into something else. So you want to be able to find the, the name spelled the way you know it should be. So here's a blow up of it. So if you see down the second from the bottom, there's Anna Maria Juliana Grau, and she immigrated in 1854, which was about the time period uh, Jan thought they had. And in that very uh, far right hand column in the bone plots, and this is what data, these immigrant databases are really good for, is a lot of times they're going to give you their last place of residence. And so it said Eigenhof. And of course, Hof means a farm. So we debated in the group, OK, does this mean it's a farm or what? So um, and then if you click, um, I want you to notice, too, the ID number in that um, left hand column there. That's going to be the number that if you find something in this, you're going to this means that there's an immigrant file for this person. Could be one page of something and it could be you know, numerous pages of, of things. I've seen all different kinds. And so that's the number that you would use when you get in touch with the archive. Um, and I'll show you in just a minute how you know which archive to, to contact, because there's several archives in Baden-Württemberg. And so if you click on the, the uh, magnifying glass there on the left, this is you're going to get another page. And it's a big, long um, page, so I'm gonna, I had to do it in two parts, screenshot in two parts. So there's our Grau person. The Wohnplatz was Eigenhof. Uh, she was uh, LED means that she was single. The EV means she was a Protestant. W means that she was a woman and not uh, female. And, and there's a German word that starts with a W. That means that they immigrated in 1854 on the 1st of February, to be specific. And she was going to North America. And then this is the second half of that screenshot. And so she uh, came with one, you know, just one person, although she was with other family members. And that she had 100 florin. And the most important thing on here is that, you know, okay, so it's at Eigenhof, uh, Eigenhof in Württemberg, so where? This is going to give you the Oberamt down here at the bottom. And so you can put those two town names or, or put that Oberamt, that's like the local uh, court area, and, and then you'd be able to know that the Eigenhof must be near where that town is. And the other second important thing is that it's telling you that the, this record is in the um, main archive in Stuttgart. And so from the uh, home page there, you can get the list of uh, addresses and emails for the different archives. And you can write to them, uh, send them an email, and say, I'd like to find out about the file number, whatever that file number was, and get more information. And so then Matthias, of course, um, goes all out. And he found uh, a map for her that, uh, as you see there up in the left-hand corner, Eigenhof, just the little farm up there. So this is nice to add to your collection. So what did we use again? Census records, which was very important for showing you that, that he came from Württemberg. Uh, she checked death records in a bit. Those church indexes again, and those, like I said, stress that they're um, local. And sometimes you need to contact um, the church itself or a local historical society, genealogy society, the local library. I haven't always looked far. Um, in a little town, if my people come from a small town, if they have a public library and if they have a genealogy department. And the immigration and naturalization, again, the naturalization said Württemberg. So, um, and then you were able to use a more advanced resource as to uh, immigrant database for a specific area of Germany. So that's how that uh, was solved. So next one is case study number four, um, advanced resources. Also, we're going to talk about a problem with a common name. Uh, Herman Jacob. It's many times it's misspelled as Jacobs. And Herman was born in 1861 and died in 1936. 
He immigrated about 1881. And a census from 1900 through 1930 uh, gives no mention of hometown names. He married in St. Louis in 1886, and uh, she found a, a civil and an evangelical church record, but um, no hometown found. She didn't get lucky on that one. So she had the church records for all the children's baptisms and confirmations, and she made note of all the sponsors and witnesses. And I'd like to, my two cents on this part of it is too, is uh, when you're doing this, this is a very smart idea to look at who was the witnesses at their marriage and all the children's baptisms, confirmations, but not only look for the people that were sponsors and witnesses for your family, look in the church books for who your family were sponsors for. So, you know, if you look through the thing in church books and see, um, you know, oh, there's their names and they were sponsors for whatever other family. Then that's going to give you a clue maybe that that's another relative or somebody from their village. So it, it's it's worth your while to really mine those church book records for not only uh, the direct, your direct people, but who they were associating with them too. So she checked all the city directories for the time period for Herman Jacob and she made note that there was an Ernst Jacob that lived at the same address with Herman. And so she checked death certificate, tombstone, funeral cards, obit, and all those records still only said Germany. So we're again butting our heads on the brick wall, right? So, but she had some key clues. In the city directory, Cindy noticed um, that mention of an Ernst Jacob. He was a cigar maker, which her Herman, and there you again, you're going to use his occupation to kind of uh, narrow down, especially when you got these common names. And she kept note of all those sponsors at children's baptisms, and one of those was named Henry Vogelsang, and he was mentioned one time, and his wife, Louise, was mentioned three times. So who were those Vogelsangs, and who was Ernst Jacob? So she went to family search and did a search and she found a Herman Heinrich Jacob that was born on the correct date in 1861 in Hereford, Westphalia. But, you know, common name and just because the date was, you know, right, wasn't sure exactly if that was her guy. So she needed additional verification. And so she tried putting in Ernst Jacob and he was born of the same parents. And uh, Henry Vogelsang was also baptized in Hereford Church. So, you know, those were a couple of people that he was associated with, and it makes sense that they were connected and they both all ended up in the same thing. So that's a pretty good idea that, that, that Hereford was the right place. Um, and later, Ancestry made passport files available, and Herman and his family went back to Germany in the early 1900s. So the passport, too, was even more verification. And I wanted to say something about this passport. I know when um, most of my family was here previous to uh, 1892 when Ellis Island uh, opened up, and I always thought, well, my people were too poor. They would have never went back home again. And uh, you don't know that. So don't assume and don't uh, not check something because of your assumptions. Uh, a lot of times people, you know, maybe they made, I'm not saying they made a fortune, but they made more money than they did in Germany, and so they were able to do a trip like that. So if you want to check not only Ancestry, but check ellisisland.org. A lot of times if they did go back, they had to apply for a passport, which those records are um, on Ancestry for U.S. passports. And then check on Ellis Island, because a lot of times the ship's records will show them coming back into the country. You also want to check Ellis Island. Sometimes maybe your people had been here since the 1860s, 1870s. But remember chain migration. And maybe somebody from their family came later and came after 1892. And they might have been in either the, the castlegarden.org uh, database or ellisisland.org. And a lot of times they would have said where they came from. And they, I think after 1900, they, they kind of ask, where are you going in the United States? So they might have mentioned your ancestor's name. I'm going to visit my Uncle Herman, you know, in St. Louis or whatever. So don't uh, assume that your people didn't go back because they may have. And it's worth the while to give it a check. So what records did she check? She did the civil and the church indexes again. 
censuses and immigration, uh, death certificate and records. And the most important thing here was the witnesses and sponsors. She made sure she made note of that and really mined those church books for those people and then did a family search and the passport, which helped to verify that those were the correct people. So I'm sure you've all heard of the fan, friends, uh, associates, and neighbors. So she used that uh, resource to try to, and was successful in finding the hometown. So we're gonna do another one of Cindy's, and this was for Friedrich Heuermann, and also known as Fritz or Fred. He was born the 27th of September, 1849. And census records again, 1870, 80, and 1900 just said Germany. He immigrated uh, about 1869 per the 1900 census. So, he was married in 1874, but again, no hometown mentioned in the church records. And so she reached out to other people researching the Hoyerman name in, in St. Louis. And her backstory for this uh, problem was that um, her father had been contacted by a woman who was uh, researching this Hoyerman's names and she was trying to collect, um, do a surname study on all the people in St. Louis that had this uh, last name. And so at the time, Cindy wasn't uh, researching or wasn't into genealogy yet. So when, when she was, then she remembered this woman and got in touch with her. And this lady, like I said, was doing a surname study of all the people that had that last name um, in St. Louis. And so then she was putting that on a spreadsheet and, and um, trying to figure out who belonged to who. And she told Cindy that the only uh, thing that she um, had that even mentioned a hometown, uh, because they didn't know how many of these Hoyerman men were related, and a lot of times you're going to find this too, a lot of people were called by the same name, you know, Fred or Fritz Hoyerman, so who's who? And the only thing that mentioned a hometown name was, was found in the Civil War pension record of a Henry Hoyerman, and the, the hometown was uh, Neunkirchen by Mella. And so, um, but... In the pension record, now a lot of you I know probably come across Civil War indexes online, but again, don't stop at the index. You want to get the pension record from the National Archives in Washington because in there, there's lots of um, documentation that people had to provide to uh, before they were allowed to get this pension. So the widow of this Henry Harriman, um, you know, had to give a deposition. And she went into a whole story about when the brothers came over and some of the sisters uh, also. So we, you know, thinking that this Henry Hoyerman was some, some kind of a, or ended up being a half brother of, to uh, Friedrich Hoyerman. But that was in the, the deposition of the widow. And, and so this Nine Kirken by Mella, um, you know, she found out, Sydney found out later that this was an area in Hanover that uh, she had no access to the records to prove it one way or the other. Uh, a lot of this, uh, area up there was never microfilmed and so you had no um, way to research the church records so she just had to wait and uh, I guess at one time uh, she said in her statement to me of how she found this she she didn't didn't really couldn't verify this until um, Matthias who helps out my group a lot uh, found the immigration uh, papers for Fred in the uh, archives in Osnabrück um, and then uh, later on we um, she had hired us to go when Matthias and I went to um, over to this area to try to see if we could get church book records for her from over there. And uh, a lot of times in these um, little church offices and that the keeper of the books are quite uh, territorial. And so we had found a man and he sat was sitting there and he wanted to be the one that turned the pages of the book. And we were asking him for certain dates. And uh, a lot of times researchers there uh, will only give you trans transcriptions of what they find in there. Uh, I know I've had people that have hired researchers and they get typed back of, of, of you know what they have found and transcribed from the books, but no actual documents. And of course, most of us like to have copies of the actual documents. So uh, she said uh, that uh, the only uh, images that she got for Fred's baptism was because that uh, Matthias was standing behind this guy taking pictures over his shoulder of the uh, of the doc of the book so she finally was able to prove that uh, her Friedrich Hoyerman was from Nine Kirk by Mella 
And we just got bad news that uh, these records were supposed to be going on this for this particular area of near Mela onto archeon.de, which is a German Protestant uh, archives uh, group that's uh, posting things online, church books online, digitized copies. And there was finally, this was finally going to be online here to this year. And they found that the digitized copies were not good. And so they had to redo them. So it's probably going to be next year again before that area of Germany is online anywhere. So she again, she used a census and immigration. She looked at church records. She tried the fan club. And what was interesting was the surname study. And she said, um, her comment about this case was, if I had anything at all to say about cracking this case, it's the fact that uh, Mary, the lady that did the very comprehensive name search on Hoyerman family, she looked at every Hoyerman in St. Louis and put all the births, marriages, and deaths in an Excel spreadsheet. And then she started separating out the families and come to find out that her, this lady's, Mary's, her Hoyermans were from another town up in that area called Borkholzhausen, but she doesn't think that they were connected. And that's another uh, topic too, is that a lot of times you're gonna find surnames that are in you know, close by towns and you think, well, they must be related to me or they're even in the same hometown. It's not always the case. Sometimes it's a common name and there could be uh, families that have it and they're not related at all. And the other thing that really cracked this case was the Civil War pension. So as I said, if you do have an index um, that you know your ancestor fought in the Civil War or someone in the family did, uh, you want to get the whole file and that's uh, available at the National Archives in Washington because in there, especially for well, Germans and Irish also, they might have told, uh, they asked where they were born and so uh, maybe the widow or the, uh, the man himself trying to get the pension would have told where they came from. So, whoops. Uh, so we're gonna do case study number six, which was a little bit more difficult case. This was another member of my group. So his name is Dave and his ancestor was Georg Stefan Berger, born the 11th of January, 1824. And the family knew that um, they lived in Illinois. And so using the census, he found that they lived in Grundy County, Illinois. He immigrated about 1851. He found him on ancestry using ship's records, which only said Germany, but he found him traveling with his future wife, Margareta Katarina Krug, and his sister, Eva Marie Berger. So he found him in the 1860, 1870, and the 1880 census, but not 1900. So clues from the census, birthplace said Bavaria. And so now he thinks, well, his possible death was between 1880 and 1900. So see again, those early census records, when they asked them, they might've said what area of Germany that they came from instead of just Germany. So at least it helps you to narrow it down. So Grundy and Will County shared a genealogy society. And so he contacted, he had contact with a member through message board and this lady had a naturalization record, which uh, said that he denounced allegiance to Maximilian, the King of Bavaria, but nothing more. But there's two things that are saying Bavaria now. So this genealogy society member also informed him that the church that this Georg had attended had burned down and there was no record survived. So there's no church records, which is a big blow because we like, we like to use those church records. Um, and so a marriage record, either civil or church, between uh, Georg and Margarita Krug has never been found. And they had the family story, which a lot of people have, that, he would, that they were married on the ship coming over, but he never has found proof of that. There was no pre-1900 death certificates in Illinois at that time, but he did find that uh, Grundy County had a death register, um, but Georg was not found in that either. So... He went to the cemetery and he got a birth and death date from the tombstone, uh, but again, no hometown. So he's really striking out all over the place. He searched for an obit at the local library, didn't find anything, but he did find a brief mention of his uh, death in a neighboring county newspapers, but didn't mention a hometown. But again, if your people lived in a, in a small town, uh, maybe they didn't have a newspaper 
but always kind of check to see if there was a county newspaper. Remember, if you've ever looked through these uh, old historical newspapers, these people needed content. And so they wrote about anything and everything. So maybe there was a county um, newspaper. And so and a lot of these are online now on newspapers.com and other places. Um, it wor it's worth your while to, to check that out. A lot easier than cranking microfilm looking at those old uh, uh, papers, which I did years ago. So he was running out of options to find this uh, person. We knew Bavaria and that was it. So there's also county histories and um, um, I'll tell you about that in just a second, but he checked for that and, and there was nothing for Georg. So that's another thing to remember that if they lived in, in it doesn't necessarily have to be small communities, but a lot of communities, bigger and small, had these county histories and you, um, had a bio or they talked about leading members of the town or could be anybody in there. So you always, and some of those are on um, Google books. Uh, you can look for the county histories. A family search maybe has, if you look in their catalog for the particular county that your person, they might have some. And a lot of those are, have been digitized and are, are put on family search for free. So don't, don't forget about those. So, but he also used these county histories to check for other immigrant families that settled in the same county. Doesn't necessarily have to be your um, family, you know, who else was settled in that area because they could have followed a, a fellow villager or something, see what, what they've got in there. But he did find an entry for Charles Philman, who was Georg's nephew from, remember the sister Eva Maria that came over with Georg. Um, so this was uh, her son. And Charles's entry bio had detailed information about his parents and his grandparents, including that his mother was from Kaudorf, Bavaria. So there we go. We, you know, had Bavaria and a couple other uh, documents beforehand. And now here, this is telling us a particular place. And of course, then you have to check to make sure that that is spelt right. And you look at Myers Gas to see if there is a Kaudorf, Bavaria. Um, and which there is. It's in Middle Franken. Bavaria church records for this town, though, were not filmed by the LDS, and also copies were not sent to the Lutheran Archive in Nuremberg. For those of you that maybe have been doing research in Bavaria, that tends to be a harder place also because a lot of the churches did not allow uh, microfilming of them. So it's a little bit harder sometimes to get Bavarian records. So contact with the local church was the only way to get information. And so uh, the books for this church now were located in the village of Tan. And I asked Dave about, you know, how did you, uh, you know, find where the books were located? And of course, this is another thing that German researchers have to know is that you have to find out the parish. Just because you found a town name doesn't necessarily mean they had a parish where the people went to church. They might've been in the next village over. So there's several ways to try to find that out. You can look at, at Myers Gas again and uh, see whether where it'll show you where the close if the pair if the town itself has a church or whether where the next closest one is. Uh, we kind of showed how to use that in one of our previous uh, webinars that we did on the three three steps to prepare for a German heritage trip. But what Dave used and there's another good set of books that are called the German Map Guide books by Kevin Hansen. And these books are usually available in a genealogy library. Um, you could even look on WorldCat and see if anybody's you know, public library near you has them. They're also available to purchase. And, and what it is is a set of books that this man has written for each state in Germany and uh, gives you the town name and then it tells you where the, the parish records would be, what parish it was. And even um, if they have been microfilmed, it gives you the, the, micro, the old uh, family history uh, microfilm number. So that's what he um, used to find out that that's where the, the uh, church books were. And so he sent a letter to the church and to the mayor and um, he, uh, mayor passed on the request to a local woman who looked up and confirmed that this Georg Berger was born and raised in Cardoff. So yippee. Uh, interesting thing that he also told me about this when he sent the letter, he sent it in a colored envelope to just make it stand out more than what the normal mail. So people probably say, well, what is this in this colored envelope? I thought that was a really cool idea. 
And so um, later, a new resource also became available, the Intelligence Blot newspaper online at Google Books, uh, the three immigrants' notice of immigration in the paper before they left. I'll explain what Auswanderung means in just a moment. So at one of our uh, Germans in St. Louis meeting, I had talked about, um, that this was quite a few years ago, that this Intelligence Blot newspaper um, was online. And um, what it is, is when people immigrated from Germany, when they were immigrating legally, they would have to go to the local court and apply for immigration. So as we saw, that started a file, these immigrant files. And usually when they were going to leave the country, the authorities would place an ad in a local newspaper to say, you know, the following people are getting ready to leave the country. If you have any cause against them, you know, they're only going to you know, be around here for a certain, till a certain date or whatever. Um, this is your chance to get in touch with them. So that's what a lot of these people are building. These German researchers are building these databases from these newspaper articles or else they go to the archives and find these uh, immigrant uh, files and, and index them. This is how I found one of my Bavarian uh, great grandmothers was through a newspaper. This was many years ago and I had hired a, a researcher that was building this. It wasn't even a, it wasn't an online database. I think he had it on maybe cards at his house or something. And, uh, and if, you know, she was listed in there that she was leaving and it tells their name of the town that they came from. So um, we're gonna talk about Google Books and how to do this in the handout. Um, I had forgotten to put the word in, but I think I changed it. And so uh, when you want to look on Google, just go to Google Books and you do that by just you know, Googling Google Books. And, and then you want to put your ancestor's uh, name in there and then uh, put that Auswanderung word behind it. That means immigration or immigrant. And that you can put the year that they immigrated, you can do, do it both ways, with or without. And sometimes what will come up is um, this newspaper. Uh, I know that there's uh, newspapers for uh, Mittelfranken, uh, Oberfranken, uh, Unterfranken. I know, I think there's some for the Rhineland area. I just don't know what all's on there nowadays. So just, you can try that and you might, you might get some other kind of a, a document that comes up with that name in it. Um, of course, it's gonna probably be in German, but you can help, help you know, have somebody to help you to read that. And uh, this is how he solved this case. So, so he had um, several different ways. And we're gonna go through all the different things that he had searched to solve this case. So he searched ships records and census records and the local genealogy society uh, database, I mean, um, message boards, the naturalization record that said Bavaria. There were no U.S. church records, so he had to keep plodding on. He looked at a death register in the cemetery, obit to check local and county papers. Uh, county histories are pretty important. And the German church records were not filmed, so again, another stumbling block. Um, the records were not in the German archive. And so he contacted the local church and a mayor. And like I said, I think the idea of a colored envelope was, was cute and worked. And he contacted a local researcher who verified that yes, his person was from there. And he found the immigration notice in a German newspaper. So that was a difficult case that we used many different uh, methods to try to find uh, this person and he was successful. So we're going to talk, I'm going to show you, have Matthias show you a, a Google book uh, that discovered how he made and also uh, we'll, if you've got any resource that you can share that helped you, uh, we'd like to hear about that. So Matthias, do you want to share your screen and show how you found a Google book discovery? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can do this. All right, I'll stop sharing and you can yeah. take over. Okay, so moment. So I had one immigrant uh, who I could, yeah, not not found or found on ancestry, and there was somebody with a tree, but the birthdays was was I said time frame for twenty years, and I was never sure. And then one day I had the idea to just toy Google Books because I've never searched there and I uh, typed in his name 
and uh, I get a couple of results. The first hint here is pretty good because it gives the age and they came to the United States in 1845. And I thought, okay, have a closer look. And let me explain a little bit. You were looking for descendants of all the people that immigrated from your family, correct? Yeah, also, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you were searching for somebody in the United mm -hmm. States. Yeah. And this guy here was, you see age again, was a native of Prussia, was fine. This was pretty good. And uh, in 1845, it was right the year what I was searching for. But it has not given on the next couple pages any birth location. It only gave his death date on the 4th of July. He died and so since I'm a member in the or also society in Osnabrück and we have something like a sister city society with Cincinnati where many people from our area immigrated. I asked them for help and somebody looked up the church books and the church books are only available in Cincinnati, the, uh, what I know, not even family search has them so far. And uh, sent me a copy of the church book, uh, I have to share my different screen and I got them this church book's entry here. Can you see it? Yes, I can, very cool. Uh -huh. And at the top, oops, a little bit close. This is written in German. So this is him. Oh, he died on, he, yeah, he dies on the 3rd of July. He gives the age, 20 years old. And he has given some more information that he was born uh, in Ringhausen, in Prussia, in Preussen. And he left, left behind his wife and two kids. And this Ringhausen is the low German version of the town uh, where he was from, this is Rödinghausen. And thank goodness I have known this at this time. Otherwise I would still have thought that would be not the right guy. Yeah, very true. And so you have to kind of know a little bit of history of the area in some cases too, right? That, um, that those people in that particular area spoke Plattdeutsch or Low German. And yes, this helps. <laughs> and he probably must have told his wife or somebody else who ever have, has given the information to the minister who, uh, that he was from Ringhausen. Mm -hmm. And as he said, Matthias said, if he was, just took that name and, looked, and started to look for it, he wouldn't find it because there is no Ringhausen. Or have, and did you look? Is there one? But just not in your area? Mm, uh, not what I know that, that there is one. So... Um, you still have a little bit of uh, confusion sometimes, but uh, at least he verified that this person was who who you were looking for, correct? Correct. Yeah. So um, that's just another way of how he used Google Books. Uh, you can find uh, a lot of different things. Just try putting the name in there. And as I put in the handout, you can use the uh, word for immigrant, Auswanderung. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Say it again, Paris Matthias. Auswanderung? Yeah, wrong at the end. Um, I put that in the, in the handout, and then you can see if there's anything comes up for you. So, well, thank you. And you want to give me the screen back? And because we're going to try to finish up here. Uh, one moment. Okay, and then I have to share. I'm coming. <laughs> okay, sorry. So um, we ask uh, if you have any resource that you'd like to send to us that uh, might uh, be something helpful for other people that helped you to crack your case. So we'd like to have that. You can send us an email. And lastly, I'm just going to tell you or show you what Family Tree Tours has planned for 2021. And we're keeping our fingers crossed that this comes to be. So we are going to this Northwest area of Germany, um, both in May and October, since we had a group from uh, May of this year that most of the people are going back. So we opened up another um, tour for that since we had some more interest. 
Uh, Rhineland Falls, we're going to stay in a beautiful four-star hotel overlooking the Rhine River, and we will take a Rhine cruise, and then plus if you have hometowns in this particular area, we'll get you to your hometown. And we're rescheduling our Christmas market tour that we were supposed to do this year to next year also. So we'll, we'll see what happens and see if we add anything else to it. But you can check us out at FamilyTreeTours.com to see what tours we'll be trying to do for next year. So thank you all very much for attending this webinar and hopefully we will see you next month.